So welcome to the National Indigenous Agriculture and Foods Sharing Circles. Some of you joined us uh, last year when we did these as well. These are hosted by the Canadian Agricultural Human Resources Council that provides human resources uh, support services to our food producers across Canada itself. We also have an Indigenous Advisory Committee, um, which is um, includes people like Paul Langdon and Trevor Kemp Thorne, um, Harold Aljam, Dale Warm, uh, Dawn, Matt, uh, Dawn, I apologize for not remembering her last name at the moment. We've got representatives from across Canada that join us and guide us in developing Indigenous agricultural initiatives related to um, um, returning Indigenous people to the land through agriculture itself, developing skills and hopefully inspiring more young people to choose agriculture and agri-foods as a, as a career. For Indigenous people, agriculture also includes ag um, aquaculture and uh, food production and preparation harvesting as well. So um, a little bit on this again, I'm on the unceded traditional lands of the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh people here in downtown Vancouver. So bear with me in case you happen to hear a siren in the background. I didn't do it. Uh, it's just that just the nature of the neighborhood that I happen to leave, live in. Today, uh, today's session is actually going to be on green housing. We have a little change to our speakers, our our speaker today is Trevor Kemp Thorne. I've known him man, since the beginning of the 90s through the First Nations Agriculture Association in British Columbia. Trevor has been supporting Indigenous people in BC and developing the industry and advising them on opportunities and how to how to grow their agriculture business and agri foods. He's a ton, he has a wealth and wealth of knowledge in uh, many aspects of agriculture and agri-foods. Today, he's going to be speaking on greenhousing and the different opportunities in there and how to build a greenhouse. Um, as I mentioned, there's an opportunity for you to ask questions um, through the chat feature, uh, through the Q&A feature, also through um, at the end of his presentation, um, you can. there's a feature where you can raise your hand. So feel free to do that as well. Uh, and then we also have Paul Langdon for Ulnawig. Ulnawig is an Indigenous capital corporation. They lend and support Indigenous people starting businesses in Atlantic Canada. So he's going to talk a little bit. And if you stay to the end of the session, we do a draw um, at the end of the session for $400. You must be in attendance to win. To win. Um, if you're not, then we just draw another name. So keep, keep that in mind. Um, when it, uh, and we are targeted to complete at the top of the hour. So um, thank you for spending this one hour with us. Um, our first guest speaker is actually just going to be Jen, uh, Jennifer Wright. Jennifer is the acting CEO of the Canadian Agriculture Human Resources Council. So Jennifer, please join us. Hi, everyone, and uh, I don't want to take too much time. I just wanted to give words of welcome from the Canadian Agriculture Human Resource Council and uh, really looking forward to the conversation today. Um, as you know, we've been hosting the Sharing Circles uh, series, um, one series in fall 2021. Uh, the recordings can be found online and the series uh, over the fall 2022. Um, so very much looking forward to the conversation and uh, um, welcome and thanks so much for taking your time to participate. Back over to you, Beverly. Thanks, Lynn. Thanks, Jennifer. Quick, a couple of welcomes to uh, Roxanne Notley. She's from um, hometown of Port Hope Simpson in Labrador, and then and she's in the traditional territory of the Nunukavik Inuit, uh, to Ken from the Anishinaabeg lands near Campbell, Ontario. We've got Helsey Sai joining from Winnipeg on the traditional uh, Treaty 1 territory, the tr traditional lands of the An Anishinaabeg Cree, Dakota, Dene, Oji Cree, and homelands of the Métis Nation. Heather Charles, welcome again from the Chippewas of Georgina Island, and also to Kevin for, uh, Karen from Winnipeg, joining us from Winnipeg, and Jennifer Bullade, joining us from the unceded Gitsan Territory. So as Jennifer mentioned, the session is being recorded um, for the opportunity for you to go back and visit the website, uh, the, the recording later on, um, catch anything you missed also, and to share with people who were not able to join us in this session. 
So again, our session speaker is Trevor Kemp Thorne. He's with the First Nations Agriculture Association of British Columbia, but mostly Trevor is an incredible wealth of knowledge on many different things. And as we are all moving into a new a new era following the pandemic, food security and and uh, and quality food is at the top of everybody's mind. Uh, First Nations communities in Indigenous people across these lands, um, growing your own food and and um, and knowing where it's coming from and having accessible food. So, Trevor, you are now online, and he'll just let me know when to change the buttons. So, everybody, let's uh, let's focus and 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 join me in welcoming Trevor Camp Thorne. Okay, so I'm coming to you from the unceded uh, territory of the uh, Kamloops Sequoia people. Uh, and I have, a, as Beverly said, many years experience working with indigenous communities. Um, I've also owned and operated uh, commercial greenhouses and I do it as a hobby now. I'm trying to retire, but Beverly keeps dragging me back. So <laughs> anyway, um, what I'd like to do is, is just, uh, I put this presentation together and uh, then I kind of looked at the notes there and sent me afterwards. So if there's anything that, that I'm not answering in the presentation, please feel free to ask me and uh, I'll do my best to try and answer it. So where are we at here, Beverly? Uh, we're on the first slide, Trevor. So just let me know when you would want, like me to push the button. So in greenhouse planning. Okay, I'm just trying to, let me see here if I can get rid of this. So there, there's, uh, there's a lot of things in, you need to consider when you're going to set up a greenhouse operation and and what you need to do and i'm going to kind of bounce back and forth because they're all interconnected and it, it, they're all critically important i'll also cover a few of the things that you need to have within the greenhouse to make it function properly um, so let's try the next slide beverly so number one is you have to have that individual in place who can deliver on your uh, operation. Now, it's a curious greenhouse. Um, when you're putting in, uh, when you decide you're gonna go ahead with the greenhouse, the first thing I think you need to do is figure out who is going to be the one who's gonna operate it and manage it. Because if you don't have those people in place, all the money in the world isn't going to make it work properly for you. And you need to ensure that you're going to compensate those people. So you're going to keep them around. Now they ask you about your, your target markets or like who are you doing it for? And is it for food security or is it for, um, uh, it could be for native plant nursery and may have uh, for commercial use, whatever. If that's the case and you want to connect with your communities, and I always say with my age group, we kind of like to, to have that uh, personal connection where we have a sit down and, and discuss it in person. I think with the younger people now, it's more important that you figure out how you're gonna get it on social media and get the support. So if you're gonna do something in this, like this in the community, and uh, we've done both, in some communities and actually the the uh it, it was interesting to see when the community used uh, their facebook page how much how well the responses came back to us and covid really restricted us from having those in-person meetings so they were very beneficial and like i said what you have to decide what you're going to grow why you're going to grow it um if and again what I've run across in the last two years primarily has been, it's for food security. So um, it may be used for just getting your plants started up and then being able to trans transfer them out into two gardens, or it may be uh, a greenhouse that's built with the idea of being a, a, 
self-contained and, and, and fully operational with inside um, when you're doing that type of thing. Let's go to the next slide, Beverly. So the financials, and I, I don't think I can stress this enough because I mean, it, it's easy to get those startup dollars to get it set up and then, but then you have to continue to operate it. And the important thing, really important thing is you need to figure out how it's going to be financially sustainable on its own, because you cannot expect to be able to go out there and get grants or, or that type of funding every year to continue to operate it. And it's very stressful for the people, <laughs> as some of you probably already know, on trying to find that funding to, to operate those greenhouses. So there's a few things you can do. One of them, and, and uh, Lorna's on here, and, and this is something that she did with her gardens. They, they uh, weighed, they, they, they tracked all of their costs. They also tracked all of their harvest and they weighed all the product. And at the end of that, we put a value on that product, what dollar value of that was. And that was something that could be taken to the community and show them, yes, you guys invested this much money, but this was the return you got. So whether you're selling that product, and those are opportunities that, that can come within the community, the health department could invest dollars in purchasing the produce from a, a greenhouse operation. Also the SA department, and there's probably other ones um, that, that could also look to that. You know, I mean, you're, you're improving the health and quality of, for people in the community. So there's that option. But even if you're giving it to the food bank or a soup kitchen or something like that, or you're, you're doing elders baskets, track it, weigh it, and put a dollar value on it because it's actually, it's got real value and people need to realize that. And if, if it's not, if you, if you haven't done that, then it's, you're just standing up there saying, well, it was worth probably this much and it's not, it's actually worth exactly what you recorded in your documents. So I think that's a critical part of it. Let's try the next one, Beverly. So site selection is, is absolutely critical. And there are a number of things you need to think about. Um, the uh, BC Ministry of Agriculture, uh, we had multiple disasters in greenhouse operations in BC within the First Nation communities. And, and it was so frustrating. And so uh, working with uh, some of the people from the ministry, they put together what they call a checklist and you can get that off of the ministry's website and it's everything you should do before you start your greenhouse operation or uh, including site selection and everything so we've seen beautiful greenhouses built in a nice shaded area where the trees cover them up and they don't get any sunlight so no sunlight in a greenhouse uh, i mean now you're paying for power all the time to, to provide lighting to them if you put it in a, uh, an area where it's open to too much wind, it uh, can destroy the greenhouse. I mean, I just I just had a shed in my backyard uh, through some huge windstorms just tore to pieces the other day. So this is another consideration you need to do. And I think the most important one for me is water. We have seen absolute disasters where greenhouse operations were built and there's no access to water. So now what are you gonna do? You're gonna truck it in, that's just insane. I mean, it goes against everything you need to do. So these are three of the primary things you really need to consider and make sure you have that water um, and have the sunlight and also be sheltered from the wind. Uh, let's try the next slide, Beverly. I talk about the water here again, and then, but if you're pulling water out of a well, um, a good idea, and and it can be used in multiple ways, but it is to have a holding tank or or a cistern in the ground that allows that water to to uh, warm up a little bit. If it's too cold, it can shock the plants, and that's not good. And you must make sure there is not too much salt content. We had one operation that was set up. 
with hydroponics. They drilled the wells and it was salt water. So, I mean, it literally killed the plants from the salt. So these are the things you, with water that you really need to take into consideration and you need to have an abundance of water uh, supply all the time for your greenhouses, whether you're doing hydroponics or you're putting soil in, it doesn't matter. It's, it's critically important for that part of it. Uh, let's try the next one, Beverly. So this is probably about a hundred footer, this greenhouse. And this is pretty, pretty typical of a lot of the greenhouses we've set up. These plants you're seeing are, are in pots for the most part, but we would actually put raised beds down the sides in these greenhouses. We could start plants in there. We could grow them all season. And you can see they run their irrigation lines up above. So they just got a, a sprinkler system for watering them. But uh, this, is a, this is a very good and very efficient way to do it. They put some uh, landscape cloth down, throw a little bit of gravel on top of that if you want, and, and you have a good base for the inside of your greenhouse. Let's try the next one, Beverly. So these are some different, different styles. I think some of these pictures changed on me, but anyway, um, there's a commercial one that's off to the side there. If you looked at that one, uh, it's all vented and, and everything. And we'll go into a few of the, uh, what you need inside it in a minute here. But um, if you're doing something for, for personal use or you just need a small greenhouse, uh, maybe even just for the school, the second one there, the, the eight by 20, with the aluminum frame it is nice. The, uh, the third one with the lean to is kind of an interesting one. And you can put that, and I've seen them used where, where they're actually sunk in the ground a couple of feet and they put a brick wall or, uh, or cement wall behind it, the concrete blocks. And so the sun beats in on that and it and those blocks warm up and they heat that greenhouse and so in uh in the fraser canyon something like that can produce uh vegetables for you year round just simply because it's getting that the uh the heat it needs on a daily basis from the sun just shining down on those on those cement blocks and warming that up and having it down in the ground a couple of feet also helps you uh draw warmth from the ground up. The, the last one is a wood frame. And this is really common. And I actually have, the one I have in my own backyard is a wood frame greenhouse. And uh, we've built a lot of these. And I have a good friend who builds them uh, on a regular basis up in, in the, actually in the Gitsan territory. And uh, he's framing them up and he can put them into communities. And they tend to be, really cost efficient i in many cases if you if you have access to a local sawmill and you get a lift of lumber from them and you can frame something up that quite cheaply and you can go online and just simply find the uh the plans on, on how to build that and uh, they'll do everything from start to finish for you and what you can what you need to utilize on it uh, Let's try the next one, Beverly. So this is one that is similar to that first one that I was showing you or the, or the one that we were looking at from the inside. This is uh, what they call a 1200 series Gothic arch. It's, it's a typical one. I like this type of greenhouse because it sheds the snow really well. Uh, if you actually, <laughs> Look at the very first picture I had on my, in my introduction. That type of greenhouse, the uh, the uh, the the pitch on the roof was too shallow, and there was one typical to that here in the interior, BC, uh, heavy snow load one one uh, weekend, and the, the entire greenhouse collapsed the roof, and and just destroyed everything inside. So the pitch is really important, but these Gothic ones are good for that. They use uh, plastic 
and you use a double layer of, of this the poly that they call it, and it's UV rated for greenhouses. And uh, it goes on. And the, they can provide you with frames for the end of your greenhouses, but lots of times we've just simply gone and used uh, plywood and uh, framed them in, put in, uh, put in uh, man doors, and uh, we've even used uh, wood heaters and, and usually with a small boiler system or something inside to help heat a, a greenhouse. So let's go to the next one, Beverly. So that's a typical, um, well, that's 24 by 72. And so that would be typical to what the plans were that you were seeing there. Now the sides would roll up on this one as well. So depending on, on the area you're in, that's a, an option you can get and it, it gives you good airflow within the greenhouse. And they call these cold frames. So they're not rated for any type of heat, but uh, they can be heated and utilized and they, and I've seen them used in the Kootenays where they actually use them for native plant nursery. That's been very effective for the Tanaha nation. Um, but uh, many other regions of the province as well. Okay, Beverly, let's try another one. So this is a, these are different types of, these two here are the ones, I'm not sure what this one is, it's a plastic, but anyway. What I was looking for here was to show you was, was the different types that if you're buying that type of a greenhouse, they usually come either with, with the square tubing, which is for a, a longer or wider based greenhouse because it's stronger, or the round tubing, which is very common. And the round tubing, we did, I think, 28 greenhouses like this with round tubing that were, uh, and they were 20 by 100 foot length very good greenhouses. The nice thing about them is you can cut them in half and, and, and use half of it in one place and half in another if you need to. There's nothing really special about them. You, the only thing you need is the um, attachments they have to hold the poly in place. And it's a spring-loaded system that just goes on the end of each greenhouse. So a quick apology here, Trevor. I changed the uh the uh, images just so that they were stronger, but the square tubing here could also be used probably for a roof on it. So, but the yeah, square this tube. Is, yeah, this is different. This is yeah. Used on the roof. Yeah, the square tubing that to, uh, Trevor was referring to actually looks more like the round tube. They're singular. And so I think you're talking about using that for a frame, correct? That's the frame. Yeah, sorry. And then, sorry, I replaced it with, uh, with the closest I could find was this square tubing, which could be used for roof or, or wall uh, wall itself. So uh, that's uh, that's me. Sorry, sorry, Trevor. Thanks. Okay. So let's try the next one. Oh, there we go. So one of the things I, I think I, I really want to really want to uh, have you make, take into consideration is if you bring in people to uh, as consultants to assist you with this. And uh, I have a real issue with this because we've had a lot of consultants that have set up major disasters for communities simply because they didn't know what they were talking about um, or they were unscrupulous and, and that's a major issue. So when I go back to those greenhouses I was showing you, something like that should probably run you just one head, Beverly. Something like that should probably run you around, I'm gonna say 30,000 these days. The uh, the prices are changing so fast, it's hard to keep keep up with it. Um, 
the metal the steel is very difficult to come by at times and it, it just seems like it's a revolving door but you don't need to go out and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to set up a greenhouse and you shouldn't when you're getting started you need something that's simple and easy and basic and that will work effectively for you and that's I think should be something that you focus on. And you can't, uh, in BC, you, there's, there's things you need to consider. Like um, you can, uh, our vegetable production say is under a quota system for the most part in most of the province. So if you're thinking you're going to set up your own commercial operation and just simply ship into that, system it's not going to happen unless you've been able to access or purchase a quota you're fine selling it through farmers markets and elsewhere but um, we had consultants that came in and actually told the community if they spent three million dollars they could take over and uh, the entire lower mainland vegetable markets which is completely untrue because i mean they couldn't even sell into them simply because the distributors have to buy through the through the uh, quota board, and so that um, that kind of information can be very costly for a community, and and uh, it's, it's not it's happened multiple times actually, and so it's it's a real concern. So you need to if if something like commercialization is something you're looking at, you need to do your due diligence and make sure that you're going to be able to take that product to the marketplace for that part of it. Okay, Beverly, let's go. Cool. So these are some of the, uh, the important parts. That little fan at the top is actually the one that's used on the cold frames to separate the, the, uh, the two layers of plastic and provide you some insulation. And it uh, doesn't look, it's not, a, it's not a very big unit. But it's it's very effective and it and it works works really well. So something like that. Now, if you can't find that, I've we've actually gone to places like Princess Auto, purchase small vans that'll that'll do the job for you as well. So they're not difficult to find. You just need to find something that you can seal into that plastic in the in the inside layer, and it'll blow the two apart just a couple of inches and, and give you that insulation factor that you're looking for. Uh, heaters are important and depending on what you want to use or how, how are you going to use it, um, we've done them with, uh, with wood burners that are set up outside in a boiler system that's put into the greenhouses, it's put into the floors and uh, there's a tank in, in there and it's circulating and that it's got hot water and that's heating the greenhouses, it works really well. We've just used basic wood stoves inside greenhouses and, and, and set them up that way. We've used natural gas heaters, electric, but I mean, you, you need to figure out what's the best to utilize for yourself and, uh, and be careful. I mean, with the wood, with wood burning stoves, that is why we actually put the plywood in the end so we could actually uh, exhaust them out that way and ensure that we weren't going to burn the greenhouse down, melt the ends off of it. The other one is, is the other fan is for is circulation and it doesn't matter the size of your greenhouse, air circulation within the greenhouse is critically important. Or otherwise you're gonna wind up with all types of uh, parasites and you'll get uh, white fly, you'll get aphids, you'll get other bacteria that uh, it's harmful to your plants. And so you need good, good air circulation within the greenhouse. And, and so something that, where you can open those ends and vent them so that you can get a nice airflow is really great. If not, something like this, um, you can just simply circulate the air within the greenhouse will help you a great deal. Okay, Beverly, let's try the next one. Oh, and we're at the end of it, maybe that's fast. So that is actually it's the greenhouse that I have in my own backyard that I, I just went online, I picked up the plants, framed it in at the bottom like that with the metal and put the, the poly on, on the outside and uh, 
works great. Um, I simply use it for for uh, starting plants in the in the spring. I move them out. Uh, I grow tomatoes and peppers throughout the summer into it, and well, late into the fall. We we've had frost here already in in Kamloops, and uh, I'm still picking tomatoes in my greenhouse, and I plan to do it for another month. So. If you guys have any questions, I'm happy to try and answer them now. Great, right. thank you, thank you, Trevor. Actually, there was a uh, Tra Roxanne Notley has a couple of questions for you, um, so I'll just read those out. One is: Is chlorine water okay, or would you, uh, or would you let it sit for forty-five uh, in a forty-five gallon drum to help remove the chlorine from the water? It's it's better if you can use unchlorinated water. Uh, is un unchlorinated? Well, if if you've got chlorinated water, and geez, that's a good idea, just put it in a, in a in a drum or something like that, and let the uh, the chlorine dissipate, and then it's it's much better for the plants. You can use it, but it's better if you can get away without it. So, a great question, Roxanne. So, um, better to let the let it sit, uh, uh, the chlorine dissipate, as you suggested. Um, but it's it's usable. It's just better if it's not in there. And our second question is, do you know of any type of system that can both heat and provide power for lighting and pumps and fans that is off grid, such as wind, solar, or battery or other? Actually, I use solar on my greenhouse. <laughs> so I have solar on another building and uh, they, they run the fans in it. So they don't run the heat for me, but they'll, they'll run the fans and they can run lighting as well. That's and that's what I use. I'd like to put up uh, a turbine. I just haven't found one that uh, cost effective for me yet. But uh, yeah, and I mean, you can honestly, you can build a pretty simple turbine yourself if you want to. If you have a, access to a windmill, it's a matter of mounting an alternator and feeding the, the 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 power from the alternator into the batteries that's feeding the greenhouse, and it'll help. So, I mean, there's lots of little tricks you can do. But uh, solar panels, depending on your area, I guess, they, they work really well. Excellent. Thanks, Trevor. So, um, Heather also added a rain barrel collection for watering. Is that possible? Such as there's no chlorine or, or and it has minimal of chemicals? That's exactly what I do. Yeah. And uh, if, you, if you can do that, I mean, it's a great idea. A lot of... Uh, if, if you have access to it, and, and one of the projects we're working on, it's interesting, but we want to put uh, like a, a culvert in the ground and basically you, you cement the base of that culvert and, and let you drain your rainwater into that culvert. And it holds, you know, hundreds or not thousands of gallons, I guess, and uh, then you can pump it out for your greenhouse or your gardens. Excellent. Thanks, Trevor. Um, to our listening audience, if you have any questions, feel free to add them into the Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom chat here. So um, we've got a couple minutes for more questions. So we're going to go till about 10 to the hour. So if anyone has questions, but well, we're waiting for some new ones to come up. Trevor, you talked about a couple of different types of greenhouses. Um, you've talked about commercial, you've talked about the lean-to. Um, just a couple of questions here on it. With the lean-to, is there a benefit to it, to building it next to an established building? Oh, sure. You know, I mean, yeah. I mean, you use that back wall yeah. as a source of heat because, and you want it facing facing south so it's going to get, get the sunlight for the winter, right? And uh, that wall will, will warm up and it'll heat that greenhouse. And I mean, like they say, if you can put that a couple of feet into the ground, it's hugely beneficial in that type of a little greenhouse. Uh, so you're saying dig dig, uh, dig into the ground a bit so that part of the greenhouse is underground. You can benefit from natural earth heat and by leaning it to the building it next to the building, um, you benefit from the house, the, the building's heat already. So a bit of energy efficiency there. Yes, exactly. Excellent. 
Excellent. Great. Um, back to the chat here. She's, uh, Roxanne says, I think apart from heating, I, I think we can do with alternative energy, but the heat we need to plug into the grid or wood heat, as you mentioned. So apart from the heating, I think we can do with alternative energy, but the heat we need to plug into the grid or wood heat, as you mentioned, just keep asking just in case there's something new or interesting out there. So that. And then uh, Lynn Moreau has asked, uh, I'm wondering um, what your experience has been with dome-shaped greenhouses, because um, she's considering purchasing one. So we're seeing a lot more of the dome, the dome-shaped ones. Um, there's a woman up in Fort St. John, Paulette Flamont has built a couple of the dome ones, and, and she's also doing permaculture. So uh, Trevor, what are your thoughts on the, on the dome greenhouses? You know, I haven't had any experience with them. I don't see why they wouldn't be in the square structure. Uh, yeah. I don't, I mean, it, if I was building something like that, I would probably want to take it down into the ground. Mm -hmm. I mean, even even the greenhouse I have at home here is about a foot into the ground. Yeah. And if I was building the dome type, I think I would be down two to three feet or, or more. Because of the the area that she's in. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Um, Josh has shared uh, in the chat room borealgardens.ca. That's Paul Paulette. So if you want to see an example of what we're referring to, um, thanks, Josh, for sharing that. And Paulette's doing some pretty amazing things in 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 Fort St. John. So uh, Heather Charles has said also digging into the ground will help it from blowing over. Um, we've had the experience of significant increase in wind action over the last few years, and no more prevailing wind directions like in years past. So we've got to be prepared for unexpected um, weather changes in, in the world we're living in right now. So thanks for sharing that. And yes, Josh, Paulette's pretty darn, uh, pretty darn amazing itself. So she's doing some pretty cool things there. Um, you mentioned, um, we, we've talked a bit about commercial production. You said that we've got to be, you've got to be aware of what's going on in your province or your territory in terms of food quotas. Uh, are there any markets if a First Nation or an individual wanted to get into the commercial area? How would you suggest they get started? So, yeah, you you need to check your what what the government bodies are doing. But I, I we've talked about this in BC here and, and and there's something we'd like to do and that's basically build a, a connection between communities where they're able to, to uh, I guess, market their products to each other. And uh, basically it comes down to what we talked about the old grease trail and, and so taking product from one region to another and bringing back other product um, uh, and I think a cooperative could be set up to do that and be, you know, sustainable within BC. And I know I've, I've talked to, with Lorna at length on something like this, but uh, yeah, I mean, and there's there's interest with you know some of the communities um, in the Fraser Canyon where they have the high heat units, they can grow a lot of the peppers and, and tomatoes and products like that versus friends in further north uh, where potato production and that and other root crops are are more feasible and so it's it's a matter of, of being able to coordinate that and say okay let's you know we're producing this and we can provide this to that market and and so on so we the, the big trick is how you uh, how you link them all together and 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 get that produce back and forth and keep it uh, keep it fresh. So you're you're suggesting um, working with other First Nations, other Indigenous produce uh, greenhouse producers or farmers and 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 building your network that way. So if you can't access the the mainstream market, let's build our own. So but you could but you could sell into the local uh, farmers markets and locally. You you can uh, there now some of the local farmers markets I'm told this week mm -hmm. in BC do not allow indigenous producers in some of their markets. So um, and I think what they're doing is saying that you're outside of our region, so you're not you know you're not allowed to to uh, come in here and market and. I have a lot of issues with that. It's something we've dealt with 
for for years and years. And it's not just in the, in this part of the ag sector; it, it it goes across all sectors. And some of them have a you know some great improvements. But uh, I was kind of stunned to hear that that something like that was actually going on and within these farmers markets in BC. So I think that's something we're going to have to address and ask them what the, you know is going on because anybody who's producing should be allowed to uh, access those markets if it's if they're living in that region. Yeah, that's that's very unsettling. So, um, hey, Trevor, we've got a couple questions here that are that apply. First of all, from Jennifer uh, Bullied, any tips for insulating rain barrels in the winter months to keep them from freezing? I drain mine. Just dra draining any insulation you can think of to put on the outside, or I, you know what, I I don't like with rain barrels. I if it's gonna be that cold, uh -huh, I I just I just drain them. And I mean, I I live in a pretty temperate climate, so if I was out on the prairies or Ontario or something, I don't think I would want to have rain barrels set up in the winter time. Mm -hmm. We're looking for other other alternatives for water. So just uh, really at this stage, look for uh, other alternatives. There's not a lot at this point at this point in time. You know, I mean, you could put, you could wrap them with heat tape, but I mean, it's going to be expensive and it would be good value to do mm -hmm. something. Like that. Yeah. If they're in the ground, like I said, with the culvert, the culvert's not going to freeze. They might freeze on the top, but it, the rest of it's not going to freeze down there. Mm -hmm. so, so you could use a stock heater in something like that to open it up. Underground um, insulation or stock heat or, or uh, find another alternative source. Great, thanks. Um, comment here, uh, we've got a uh, comment I've seen, um, uh, Karen Fleming had mentioned, she's seen a lean-to in Brown and Manitoba made of metal, painted it black and attracts heat, which attracts heat and it's, uh, it works beautifully. Lots of great information and ideas that are being shared. And then um, Trevor, can you comment, this question from Lynn Morrow, can you comment on whether the vegetable production in Ontario is also supply managed? Are you aware of? I believe it is. Yeah. So there's a bit of a challenge there to access um, some markets in different regions. So you're going to need to build a strong relationship with um, uh, your your provincial or territorial Ministry of Agriculture and find out um, what markets are open and which ones are controlled by by quotas. Um, hey, uh, Trevor, we talked a bit, a bit about, like I said, commercial greenhouses, and you talked a little bit about the one you built. But can you give an idea in terms of what's the cost might be to just build a simple greenhouse in your own, in your backyard. That one I have. That, <laughs> yes. uh, mine is actually uh, ten by twenty. So it's yeah. when you get the plans, it's for a twelve ten by twelve. Mm -hmm. It cost me less than a thousand dollars. Well, okay. So about you know, it de it depends on the materials and you sort of built yeah. yours a little bit larger. Are there kits for building uh, for, uh, for backyard greenhouses? Oh yeah, but then you're, then you're probably gonna spend three or five thousand. Yeah, so okay. better so, to build one from, from your own materials instead of buying a kit. Kit yeah. is much faster, but. Well, they don't, they don't take very long. And I mean, it, it, they're, they're, they're pretty simple, basic build. And, and you just go to your local lumber yard and, and you know, pick up however many clothes you're going to require. Half of mine is actually framed with, with uh, square tubing <clears throat> because I had it on hand. And so yeah. I, I utilized it. Uh, so uh, by ground level is all square tubing. And then I have the wooden frame built on top of it. Mm. And uh, So, it, I mean, it's kind of nice that way because it keeps... It keeps the uh, the wood off the ground, and so rotting isn't an issue for me. Can you um, can you remind us again what uh, what you have at the bottom half of your greenhouse? Wood well, or metal? It's just it's just thin. It's just uh, yeah, like thin that you can you know purchase at uh, any hardware store. Yes, it's it's and it's thirty. Well, it it would depend again what you want to do, but you can get it. It's thirty two to thirty six inches. 
and and with and then it, it comes in lengths of whatever you want. Should be available at your local hardware store. Yeah, <laughs> I'm mean, go to Home Hardware, or Rona, or whoever you deal with. Yeah, it sounds like you can even use some recycled materials if there's um, an old building that uh, has some materials you can reuse. Oh, that God. seems like a. Yeah. Hey, um, Heather Charles has said, has anyone repurposed tires for agricultural purposes? Um, people using for straw brick to build home and anything else like is that even a material you might be able to use in in a greenhouse? Well. Uh, I I've seen people use them for platters and stuff like that. And I mean, you could, you could utilize them in, in that kind of a fashion, I guess, if you wanted to have some, especially in the greenhouse and you want to get it elevated, it would be a really simple way to do it. You know, just stack them up with soil and, and, and plant in them. As for walls, I've never seen anybody use them for walls, but I don't see why you couldn't. It's just the, the, the area they're going to take up when you're building something like that, right? Probably going to take up a little bit more. Okay, I'm um, just got a couple more questions before we start wrapping up here. Um, some for me. You mentioned, um, you know, selecting from your site. Uh, BC government Ministry of Agriculture has a checklist for for people, and maybe Aaron, if you can sort of pull that pull that up and share it with the group. But BC Ministries created a checklist for green housing, so very useful. But check with your um, um, with your your government agencies, they probably have some checklists for you. You mentioned sunlight, wind and water access and temperature itself. itself. Um, any, it, you, you've sort of in other comments commented on drainage, but um, uh, any, in, in terms of site selection for your greenhouse, uh, what would you recommend on the drainage bit? So, and, and that is the, uh, another point, yeah. I didn't cover actually, but you do, you should look for a location that has the drain. You're not going to put it in a, in a, in a boggy area. So, um, because I mean, it's going to cause you a lot of problems, probably, especially with parasites, but also other difficulty with the greenhouse that you don't want to need to deal with. So, good drainage is, is very important. Um, so, most sites that we've ever built on, we would put like crushed rock or gravel down mm -hmm. in the greenhouse simply to to avoid having to deal with with uh, uh, yeah mud and, and whatever within the greenhouse so it keeps it dry and clean and it, and it cuts down on any kind of parasites that you might have to would come about because of the boggy water or boggy soils. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's that one. And I, um, by the way, for our listening audience, Aaron has shared through the chat line the BC checklist for greenhousing. And then um, one last question before we conti continue with our next speaker here, and that is um, consultants. What are some of the qualities you're looking for in a consultant if if, uh, if a community is seeking one for um, advice and 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 planning for their greenhouse? Somebody who's honest. <laughs> well yeah but anything else of course well, they should be honest them, for me that's number one because so many of them are not and yeah. there's been multiple disasters and, and people actually i've seen companies put up and say look we did this in a community but if you actually followed up and found out what kind of a disaster that greenhouse operation was it never functioned yikes you know, and you're talking where communities are talking is spending hundreds of thousands of dollars to to do this. And I've had them where they've actually, and Brian brought a couple to me where where these consultants came in and, and literally tried to convince a community into spending, oh, you know, million plus on these operations. And uh, and that was one of them was to do it was a vegetable production operation that. Uh, they wouldn't have been able to sell the product into the into the marketplace simply because of the quota system. And their response to me was, "Well, we'll ship it to Mac or we'll ship it to Quebec. So if you're on Vancouver Island, and how much is it going to cost you to freight it over, get it over to the mainland, and then get it on a plane and ship it to Quebec? And can you even compete with the Mexicans when they're doing the same thing?" 
So, so repu- reputation is one and check really checking your source. Cause and so if, yeah. if a consultant has said they worked for such and such a community, they might have, but it, you need to check with the community to make sure that the experience was a positive one and that the consultant knows their region, right. And knows the market. Yeah. Cause we've had consultants from other provinces come in and, and make recommendations here and have no idea about the market or or the climate or anything, you know, I mean, it, it just some ridiculous comments that come from them. So you should know if you're yeah. working in Northwest Territories, they should know how things work in Northwest Territories. If it's Manitoba, they should know how things work in Manitoba and they should probably visit the site too. There's a big difference. They should, in- they should absolutely visit the site mm-hmm. and they should have a community consultation and they even see if what they're talking about is feasible or even of interest. Because yeah. a lot of times, and I can tell you one example of where there's this disaster with the greenhouses. I was up there in a meeting and uh, sitting down with, with some of the elders and we're having some lunch and, and they were telling me, they said, yeah, we said, no, you can't, you can't build it there. It's not going to work. And they went ahead anyway. And so all these, you know, all this money is spent on these greenhouses. they simply don't function can't because there's no water no access that's very sad great thank you very much for your time trevor and thank you guys for for listening here um excellent comments and again a reminder that this presentation will be available on online um and trevor if anyone would you like to share your contact information with anybody here feel free to do so in the chat if anyone want to want to grab it we've got one more thing to do two more things to do before we we end here at the top of the at the top of the hour i'm going to invite our guest speaker we when we do deliver these sessions we like to have um um a co-host with us a regional host so today's regional host is is Paul Langdon. He's with Ulnawig um, out of Atlantic Canada. For those of you that don't know what an Indigenous Capital Corporation does, this uh, Paul's going to give us a little bit of information on this. And then Paul, if you'd like to join us online, please. Thank you, Beverly. And, and thank you, Trevor. That was an informative and interesting presentation on greenhouses. And uh, I'll, I'll briefly talk about Ulnawig. Ulnawig is the Atlantic Canada Indigenous uh, Aboriginal Financial Institute for all of the four provinces, and, w- and we cover all three identified Indigenous groups, the Métis, Inuit, and, and Status Indians, First Nations. Oh, we, we've taken a different sort of pitch uh, than others, uh, and we've moved into sectors that uh, require some specialized, uh, innovative approaches to it, and, and you know, including the ocean economy here with agriculture, um, forestry, but also in, in agriculture. And I'm, I'm pleased to participate on, on this committee on, on a national basis to give our input and our insights of what we see happening here. Uh, there is are great potentials. We, we uh, through our foundation that we set up, are doing uh, projects in the greenhouse um, in, in several communities, but our involvement has started even from a simple thing of uh, at, a, at an event, uh, one of our uh, associated uh, guys whose son has a heritage seed company gave out seeds and and they were taken back to the communities and started and and people got interested in in growing market gardens right from literally a package of seeds and so we've been encouraging individuals and and community groups to participate in the the concept of a a greenhouse or market garden opportunities is is very unique and is very entrepreneurial you can do it from a very small a hot box or you can let it grow into a large commercial greenhouse operation but those same principles are, are going to be involved your inputs are going to be similar uh you will need to you know make sure you have figured it out and and, and have it planned out uh where where you're going to go uh, we do not have and I'm, i was interested to hear that uh, there are quotas for vegetables in bc i think it's the only province in canada that has those uh, i can uh, shortly say it's not Nova Scotia because way back when I was in university here in the Annapolis Valley we did a study on that uh, was part of our our group of because poultry and uh, eggs and dairy were, were very much the topic uh, veg the fruit and vegetable producers down here said no to a market gardening and so it, it has not been part of it but uh, I guess the, the the final comment here is, is that um, and, and and just to reiterate what Trevor said Consultants and, and identifying who, who is a good consultant is a challenge, but it doesn't matter what sector you're in. There are always consultants out there that are 
not as good as they say they are, but there are others that are very good. And, and my, my only comment would be is to talk to the people in the know, uh, make sure you check your references. But in agriculture, Farm Credit Corporation, the national organization and the, and the provincial organizations have an interest in encouraging Indigenous uh, engagement. And so don't, don't hesitate to reach out to them and you will find them as a, as a willing source. And uh, in, the, in the few projects I've been he involved here with agriculture, I've reached out to the province and to the feds, and they've been very supportive of and engaging and rec recommending various consultants who could do it. Uh, so again, the best advice is, is to seek out and you know get the best information you can to make your decisions. But uh, that being said, uh, it, it, it is a great opportunity uh, for food security, whether it's in agriculture or agriculture. It is entrepreneurial, but it can also function as a social enterprise. So uh, I think there's, there's a vast opportunity out there. So I would encourage anybody who has an interest to, to get, you know, get the information that you can. It's readily available uh, and, and just start it. You, you know, it, it will be worth your while. And I thank you for the opportunity to present and, and chat here today. Yes, I'm very, very, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, again, um, Ulnawig is an Indigenous capital corporation. It does help and support and lend funds and uh, develop other initiatives for Indigenous people of all backgrounds living in Atlantic Canada. But do visit their website because it is one of my favorite Indigenous Capital Corporation websites is incredibly useful. It's got some good planning tools in it, um, which are basically, to my, in my opinion, second to none. So, um, and one of the things Paul mentioned was uh, on the consultants, um, check with your Indigenous Capital Corporations. They may have some recommendations as well um, because they've got experience reviewing business plans and and we'll see if, if, um, it, uh, you know, they they know who produces a good business plan and and who um, who may not be um, your best choice. So um, that's another great place to check. So, um, Paul, can I ask you to add your website address into the chat? Uh, it, well, it's simply umaweg.ca, but yes. Yeah, so. yeah. Excellent. Thank you very much, Paul. Great. Thank you. We are now on to our last and, and almost as, as important activity here. We've got um, Aaron Bryson coming up. And he's going to be doing the the draw. Um, just a quick closing thing here. We've got a couple more sessions um, coming forward, so I'll just bring those up as Aaron is getting his as Aaron is getting the um, the draw ready. So um, of course you must be present to win. So if uh, if your name is called, let us know by um, um, putting a message in chat itself. Um, food labeling is our next session on November 15th. So we've got Dale Worm. He's going to be speaking on that. So for National Indigenous Agriculture Association. So for those of you who are getting into even kitchen kitchen planning, starting and packaging food in your kitchen and getting into a, a more regional or, or commercial market, that will be a good session for you. So that our next session is on November 15th, two weeks from now, food labeling, food packaging. Then um, at the end of the month, we've got Lorna Shooter. She's with Lower Nicola Indian Band, and she's going to talk about beehive and apiary. So Lorna and I had a conversation on this the, the other week. So we we're talking about um, how do bees know where to go So um, and uh, eat the right flowers and um we've already had composting it was our first session and storage was our last session with don taba bonding and both of these sessions are available online so um um if you want if you miss those if you want to catch up on them again they're available on the cark youtube channel and again everybody thank you for joining us and uh, uh, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at future sessions. Please tell your friends to join us as well and remind them if they miss a session, they can, can, they can review them on the Canadian Agriculture Human Resources website. So again, Karen, congratulations. Thank you to Canadian Agriculture Human Resources Council for hosting these sessions, for gathering them together. To our guest speaker and our expert, Trevor Kemp Thorne, and to Paul, Paul Langdon from Ulnawig, thank you for sharing information uh, information with us. Have a great day, everyone. Um, stay safe, stay healthy, and we look forward to seeing you in two weeks.